flock by night A new shining star They hear a choir sing Music come from afar Now Joseph and his wife
John Virgin Mother and Child Holy Infant So Tender And Mild Sleep In Heavenly Peace Sleep
Good evening, everybody. It's great to see you here. If you'd like to find a seat, we're going to start tonight by turning our attention to the screen. Thank you. Lighting a candle is a simple yet profound act. It is a testimony to the power of light over darkness. These past weeks have reminded us that Jesus Christ is the true reason for hope, peace, joy, and love in this season and forever. As we light the Christ candle, celebrating the end of Advent and the arrival of Christ and Christmas, let us remember how our Savior came once as a lowly baby that the world through him might be saved and how he will return one day in glory. John 1, verse 19, 9 to 14. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And from John 8, verse 12. Then Jesus spoke again to the people. He said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Well, good evening, everybody. We give you a very warm welcome to our Christmas Eve service. It's not long now, is it? 
do we celebrate the wonderful birth of Jesus, God's precious gift given to us? And there's that little video I showed us, and we've been looking over these past few weeks, just that gift of joy and hope and peace and love and God's presence with us. We have much to praise for, God for. And that's how we're going to start this evening. I'd invite you to stand, and we're going to sing, Oh, praise the name of the Lord Most High, with the Christmas refrain of, Oh, come, let us adore him as well. sing together. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed body bowed and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all Sing your praise, O oh Lord, O oh Lord our God. And then on the third at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again, O oh, trampled death. The angels wrong for Christ the King. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore for endless days. We will sing your praise, O oh Lord, O oh Lord our God. Oh, come, let us adore. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us him, Christ the Lord. He shall return in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore, for endless days we will see. Lord, O oh Lord our God, for He 
Lord Jesus, Master of both the light and the darkness, send your Holy Spirit upon our preparations for Christmas. We who have so much to do seek quiet spaces to hear your voice each day. We who are anxious over many things look forward to your coming among us. We who are blessed in so many ways long for the complete joy of your kingdom. We whose hearts are heavy seek the joy of your presence. We are your people walking in darkness yet seeking the light. To you we say, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats. Our reading tonight is taken from the book of Matthew. I think I'm standing a bit close. From the book of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. May our hearts be open to the word of God. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who was born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Judea with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophets have written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least amongst the rulers of Judea. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly to him and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Well, tonight we're obviously here to focus on the gift of Jesus Christ, aren't we? But as we reflect, we're also going to have some fun. It's not going to all be serious. Uh, but just a couple of little things to let you know. And a little later on in our meeting, um, our offering uh, tonight will be donated to the Christmas Bowl. Uh, so Ian does have envelopes. If you'd like to grab uh, one of those, uh, you can fill those out uh, for tax deductible receipts and things like that. And when we get to the end, don't forget that there's supper. I think there's fruit mince pies, there's shortbread, there's fruit cake, mini, chocolate, mini Christmas puddings, hot chocolate, coffee, tea. Does that about cover it? So, yeah, you're all invited to join us for that. But children, how many children we got here tonight? Just the two? It's going to be a grudge match. Okay. <laughs> I've got a bit of a children's story for you. Well, I've got the Christmas story. Just got to get prepared. Okay. Now, a couple of weeks back, I you know, spoke at our carol service and we did some things with candy canes, didn't we? I said, you know, that candy cane can help tell the Christmas story because it's got the red on it for the blood of Jesus that he died to forgive us and the white to cleanse us. Well, I thought, well, you know, food is a really good way to tell the Christmas story. Do we agree? Okay, so we're going to have a very chocolate Christmas story. 
You know, where you might just read out the story and there's hidden names of chocolate bars in the story and you go, oh, 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 want to read it? You know, like, yeah. You get it. So in the, this story that I'm going to read, there's names of lollies or chocolate bars hidden. So I'm going to put you on two teams. Okay, so the congregation is going to be which side do you want? Which side of the congregation? Stand up and turn around and see which side look the smartest. All right, uh-huh. yep. Okay, well, Lucy, you got this side. Now, I need two other, two out of volunteers to help us. All you have to do is hold a bowl and not be tempted to pinch the chocolate. So that might count you out, Deb. That's all you got to do. Yep, okay, yep. Okay. One more to hold the bowl. This says you win each one. All right, now what I'll do, you can stand in a bit closer. You don't have to stand right out on the side. Come in a bit closer. Listen, come in. So I can see you. Otherwise, yeah. Where is it? Okay. So what I'll do, as I read through the story, I'll stop at the end of a sentence when there's a chocolate bar hidden. So I won't stop at the word, but I'll stop at the chocolate bar, and I'll try and spot, you might be able to help me, who had their hand up first, or if you guys don't recognise, who had their hand up in the congregation either side first, so perhaps the people with the bowls have to help me be a spotter as well, and we'll see who can win the most chocolate. I've just got to find it in the bag then, so that'll get easier as we go, hopefully. Okay, you ready? We all ready? Our Christmas story begins when an angel visits Mary. She was kind of surprised to see the angel there, but he said, don't be afraid, Mary. I see, yeah, Jackie? Kind of surprise. Kind of surprise. Kind of surprise. Kind of surprise. <laughs> I just didn't say it. Kinder. I said it kinder. Anyway, one for that team. So she was kind of surprised to see the angel there. But he said, don't be afraid, Mary. You're going to have a child. He will be called Jesus. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you as the child to be born is the one and only Son of God. So Mary agreed to what the angel had said. But she was terrified to tell her husband, Joseph. She thought he and other people would make snickers at her behind her back. Oh, who was first? Mine was first, mine again. All right, what? Snickers, okay. Let's see, can I find a Snickers? Oh, there's one. I'm sure there's a couple of Snickers hidden away. There we go. That's right, we'll leave it up. And Joseph was upset. So he made plans to divorce Mary. But then in a dream, an angel told Joseph to not be frightened to take Mary home as his wife, for the child she carried was indeed the son of God. Dream, okay. Can I find the dream? There we go. Right. The time came for Jesus to be born, and Joseph and Mary had to travel to Bethlehem to be counted in the census. It was a long and rocky road they had to travel. <laughs> Who do you reckon was first? Well, it probably doesn't matter because for Rocky Roads, we've got a whole packet of biscuits. So I think we might put those out for supper afterwards. Does that sound fair? Okay. So by the time they got to Bethlehem, they were really, really ready for a timeout. Oh, I think that was this side. Was it? Yeah. Timeout. That's right. I'll look the other way next time. But there was nowhere to stay. The inn was full. And that was where all that was available was a stable, somewhere where all the furry friends were kept. Furry friends! Furry friends, yeah! There we go, that'll that'll start to. Now are you ready? There's going to be pandemonium. (laughs) We're not sure exactly what animals were there. I doubt there were any caramella koalas or Fredo frogs, but I'm sure there were some dairy milk cows there chomping away on the straw. <laughs> Who's first? <laughs> All right, look, what, what? Caramella koala? Okay. Then we'll throw. Oh, can I find the caramella koala? Yep. What did you hear, Lucy? What was next? 
Carry me out of the koalas or Fred I frogs and I'm sure there's some dairy milk cows away chomping on the straw. Fred I frogs? When I find it, I think I've blown the whole chocolate bar for the chocolate budget for a year on this story. But I'm sure there were some dairy milk cows there chomping away on the straw. Dairy milk? And what was the other one? No, right, that's the wrong one. Where's the right one? There you go. Chomp. Did you get chomp? I reckon you did. Okay. And so the time was cherry ripe for the baby Jesus to be born. There you go. That's in your bowl, Lucy. He was wrapped in swaddling cloths and laid in a manger. I reckon they pinched a bit of straw back from the cows. Reckon? <laughs> now on that same night, there were some shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Being a shepherd was hard work. It was no picnic, I tell you. <laughs> Do you know what it was, though? Picnic, yeah. There we go. Some nights it probably got so freezing that their beards got a bit crunchy. Oh. Sorry? Yeah, what was it? Do you know what it was, Maya? Crunchy, yeah. An angel appeared to these shepherds to tell them that the Saviour, Christ the Lord, had just been born. Although the shepherds were scared, God knew they wouldn't flake at the sight of an angel. Flake, all right. He knew that they would go to Bethlehem and see this thing which had happened. And then, just to emphasise the point, a whole host of angels appeared to give an almighty boost to the chorus of glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favour rests. Boost! So the shepherds hurried to Bethlehem to see the child which had been born and returned telling everyone about it, glorifying and praising God. At the time Jesus was born, a bright shining star burst across the sky of the Milky Way. Alright, we'll play it one each side. Starburst, alright, Starburst on this side. Yeah, here's our bag of Starburst, but there's their ones we'll hand out. Because Kelly likes Starburst. So we'll hand about that. And what was the other one? Milky Way. There were some wise men away in the east who saw this star. These wise men were smarties. <laughs> oh, I heard, I don't know, I heard a yell from this side. Lucy? Yeah? Smarties. They knew the star wasn't just Mars doing something funny, funky, but a sign of more epic proportions. Wow, there's three Mars bars in there. And so these wise men made a break away from all that they were doing. Was it over there? Break. Break away, alright. We'll pay that one, because that one's another packet of biscuits, so they're for supper too. If you're quick, there's only six in the packet. They followed the star all the way to Israel, where they went to King Herod and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Herod didn't like what they said, but he pretended that he too wanted to worship this new king and asked the wise men to let him know when they had found him. The wise men went on that way, continuing to follow the star until it stopped over the house where Jesus was. They entered in, and with much delight, Mesopotamian, not Turkish, bowed down and worshipped Jesus. <laughs> Okay. You can save that one for me after. <laughs> then they opened their bounty of gifts. Kit Kat, gold, frankincense and myrrh. 
Bounty. And did you hear something else in that sentence? Kit Kat. Kit Kat Gold, yeah. Yeah, no, Kit Kat Gold, you see, yeah. Being one in a dream not to return to King Herod because he was only up to duty Twix and really wanted to kill the baby Jesus, the wise men returned home by another route. Yeah? Twix, okay. And so that is the story of Christmas, the story of God's love to us. God sent us the Son, the gift of His Son, Jesus, the gift which brings us hope and joy, peace, love, and the presence of God always with us. And when we believe in Jesus, when we trust in Him and all that He has done for us, God will change us each into the marvelous creations that He always planned for us to be. So there we go. And there wasn't a single chocolate Santa in sight. Uh, chocolate Santa? Chocolate Santas! Yeah, there's a bag of, a whole bag of chocolate Santas. We'll throw a couple in. All right, now, what I reckon we should do is you can pick out one small chocolate and one large chocolate that you'd like. And then afterwards, you can take them around and share them out as well. So people, that the adults can pick one large chocolate or two small chocolates. But you can have one of each. Yep, so pick out what you like and then we'll give out the rest after. How does that sound? Or do you want to take it a whole home and eat it? No. <laughs> well, if there's any left, you can take them home as well. All right, thank you. So you can pick a couple out though, Lucy. Good job. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, pick a couple out. Or you take them with you, you can pick them out and then hand them around later. After, no favouritism. <laughs> right. That's right. That's right, I've distracted her. I think now Lucy has a Christmas poem to read with us. Thank you. Jesus was born on Christmas of, on a very holy night, and in the sky above him shone the very brightest light. All the heavenly angels sang a song to praise his name. They told the low, lowly shepherds so they left their sheep and came from the east the wise men roam bringing precious gifts to share riches for the king of kings to show the savior that they care now we celebrate his birthday in our hearts and every day jesus is your humble manger your true love is here to stay So we're going to sing together again. It's a carol we don't often sing congregationally, but I think it's one of the best ones that there is, O Holy Night. We have pitched it down a little bit, so it's more manageable for us all. But, um, if you'd like to stand, let's stand, I think, <coughs> and sing of the wonderful story of that night of Christ's birth. Three love, oh, now we 
No, no, no. We're going to take up our offering. And as I said, um, we're giving tonight to the Christmas Bowl. Uh, so if you need to grab one of those envelopes from Ian, uh, please do so. Obviously, the Christmas Bowl help their work around the world and the great um, efforts that they make to assist so many. But while we do that, I thought, well, if we're helping around the world, why don't we sing an Aussie carol or two while we do that? So I've gone with one serious and one just a little bit funny. So we're going to sing Christmas Day, the north wind is tossing the leaves, and then we're going to try Aussie Jingle Bells, the Buck Owen Champs version, Rusty Holden Ute. We'll see how we go. So please join in and sing as we also take up our offering just now. Thank you. Transpose back. The north wind is tossing the leaves, the red dust is over the town, the sparrows are under the eaves, and the grass in the paddock is brown. As we lift up our voices and sing To the Christ child, the heavenly King The tree ferns and green gully sway The cool streams were silently by joy bells are greeting the day and the chimes are adrift in the sky as we lift up our voices to sing to the Christ child of the heavenly Come up and sing it, Maya. You said you wanted to beforehand. Oh, chicken. Okay. Let's go. Dashing through the bush in a rusty holding used, kicking up the dust, Esky in the boot, Kelpie by my side, singing Christmas songs. Summertime and I am in my singlet shorts and thongs oh. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way Christmas in Australia on a scorching summer's day Jingle bells, jingle bells, Christmas time is beautiful Oh what fun it is to ride in a rusty hold and use Engines getting hot, dodge the kangaroos Swaggy climbs aboard he is welcome to family in the school, sitting by the pool. Christmas day, the Aussie way by the barbecue. Whoa. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Christmas in Australia on a scorching summer's day. Jingle bells, jingle bells, Christmas time is good. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a rusty holding use. The afternoon, Grandpa has a dose. That the kids and Uncle Bruce are swimming in their clothes. The time comes round to go. We take a family snap and pack the car and all shoot through before the washing up. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Christmas in Australia on a scorching summer's day. Jingle bells, jingle bells, Christmas time is built. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a rusty holding ute. And hopefully, hopefully we will get a summer to break out the singlet shirts and thongs. Thank you. Maya is now going to come and read a poem to us. Thanks, Maya.
Christmas is forgiving and showing that we care, for honouring the Christ child with the loving gifts we share. The wise men gave of riches, the shepherd's faith and love. Each, in, each gift in its own measure was smiled on from above. Let every gift be treasured, not always size or price, determines the extent of love and willing sacrifice. Handsome gifts with fist, festive trim bring, bring smiles of sweet content, but modest gifts of humble means are oftentimes heaven sent. Whether it be large or small, each gift will share in part the message of true Christmas, gift given from the heart. Let him know when we find the baby. He too would like to worship this new king. But then instructions came from a different order. Instructions that only come from dreams. Dreams of biblical proportions. And this is what the dream said. Don't return to the king. So simple, so straightforward. And that is the dilemma that I'm wrestling with. Do I listen to earthly authority? Or maybe do I listen to the godly type? And the, and the traveler in me, the wise man as it were, would it say, go see King Herod and give him what he wants. But my heart, but my heart tells a different story. My heart says that maybe this child deserves every ounce of obedience that I could give, even if I don't quite understand the roadmap yet. If following a star seemed difficult, Following this new king may be the greatest challenge yet. <laughs> yes, my friend. I think you and I, <laughs> we are going to take the long way home. Well, we read earlier from Matthew chapter 2 about the visit of the Magi, the wise men. And from a scholarly viewpoint, it's probably the most conjectured part of the whole Christmas story. Many people have perhaps become hung up on the detail, trying to understand whether or not the story is even true. I mean, some say it reads more like a folk tale rather than focusing on the underlying truth, the very important truth that is there to be grasped. But for example, the three wise men, well, we don't know that there were even three that visited. The scripture doesn't say how many there were. It's just become traditional to think there were three because there were three gifts. Or that they rode camels. Well, I'm happy to go with that one because we had the excellent three wise camels story we shared last Sunday. Or that they were kings. Other historical traditions have perhaps lent to that. But again, there's nothing specifically to indicate that they were. Or exactly where they were from probably was not as far as the Orient, even though apparently there is one ancient writing in the Vatican Library, the Revelation of the Magi, that suggests they came from China. So I'm not really sure about the historical accuracy of the opening line of the carol, We Three Kings of Orient Are. If that gives you any ammunition, Jason, never have to sing that one again with your brothers. We don't know exactly why these men were considered wise. Magi, translated from the Greek, means wise men, but we don't know why. Or exactly when the Magi arrived. It wasn't on the same night as the shepherds. We often have them all crowded around the nativity scene at Christmas time, don't we? Or exactly what was the star and why the appearance of a star would be significant to them. 
So he said we can be prone to become overly preoccupied with all the detail of those things. However, some understanding of the history of this account, as best we can piece it out, will be, of course, helpful for what the Gospel of Matthew is trying to reveal here. You know, Matthew is often about contrasts between what our natural or our first human response is and what our response to Jesus should be. So the most commonly held view is that the Magi were an ancient priestly group who lived among the Babylonians and Medo-Persians, those areas being to the east of Israel. And these men were most likely extremely well educated for their day, considered experts in religion and history, medicine, astronomy, astrology, divination and magic. Quite a list, isn't it? And their interest in learning in astronomy, and particularly astrology, looking for signs in the stars, would have meant that the appearance of something unusual would have been very significant to them. At the time of the birth of Jesus, they say there was still a large and influential group of Jews who lived in the area of Babylon. You know, some of the Jewish people had not returned following the exile when they returned to rebuild Jerusalem. So if the Magi were from around the same area, it's certainly possible they were familiar with some of the Old Testament prophecies, and particularly those of the prophet Daniel, that foretold of a coming Messiah. Now on the star, it's been conjectured that it was an alignment of planets, such as Jupiter and Saturn, which did occur apparently in 7 BC, around the time of Jesus' birth, and is occurring again now uh, it's in the sky. It's, I think it's 2080 before we can see it again, so if you want to see it, get out now <laughs> and take a look. So perhaps it was a naturally occurring phenomenon, still within the supernatural creation of God, but that he deigned to coincide with the birth of his son. However, I did read that planetary alignments such as these were never referred to as stars at this time. And in Matthew uh, chapter 2, verse 7, it says this star appeared. I think that hints it was something that was never before seen. And verse 9 implies that it moved around. You know, the position of stars in the sky is usually fixed. And what I mean by that, they might move around the sky, but the configuration stays the same. You know, you look up and you can find the Southern Cross. It will just change depending on the Earth's rotation. So I think there's certainly a case or a belief to be made that this star was both of supernatural and of particular origin. It was something God the cause to be just for this time. The learning and knowledge of the Magi in association with the supernatural appearance of a never-before-seen star would have caused them to drop everything, pack, get ready for a journey and come to Israel. I think one of the key takeaways we should take is that the Magi were obviously keeping watch. They were constantly observing the sky, always looking for a sign of divine activity or announcement. And while it's used in quite a different sense in the Gospel of Luke and the account of the shepherds, it's interesting to ponder that the first two groups of people that the birth of Jesus was announced to were people who were keeping watch, people who were keeping a keen eye out for God to be at work. You know, perhaps even the brilliance of the host of heavenly angels that appeared on the sky and sang to the shepherds on that first Christmas night helped illuminate the supernatural star that the Magi observed at that same time. Pure speculation on my part, but maybe not impossible. So Matthew probably referred to these people as Magi, as wise men, because they had kept watch and they'd learnt enough of what this sign might mean to spur them into action. So travelling from Babylonia to Israel probably took around 40 days at least, would have taken longer if indeed they did come from further east. And while we don't know how many days exactly after the birth of Jesus the Magi arrived, what is significant is that it was a substantial journey. And while interpreting the stars and signs and following up on those were what the Magi did, they still had to make room. They still had to make room in their life to take this journey to the exclusion of whatever else was happening. And being spurred to action, they also had to make room in their life to be open to the possibilities of what God was doing. So they come to Israel. And we learn that they don't know exactly where the place the child was to be born. They believe him to be a king, so it's natural they go to the capital, to Jerusalem, where the temple and the palace were. And they ask around. As they ask around, the intent of why they came is clearly given, straight up front. They ask, where is the child? born king of the Jews, for we have come to worship him. 
their intent was always clear. Why had the Magi embarked on this trip? To come and worship the child who had been born. They were making room for that from the outset. Well, no one knows the answer to this question, it seems. The evangelising of the shepherds must not have spread past Bethlehem as yet. Or if anyone did know, you know, possibly the Magi might have received a lukewarm response when they entered Jerusalem. For one of the areas of their potential expertise that I mentioned was magic. And from the perspective of the Jewish people, magic was often looked upon with suspicion. You know, the work of demonic powers rather than godly ones. And the Magi were outsiders. They were Gentiles. So they were possibly also treated with a bit of dismissive disdain for the Jews saw them as being far outside the kingdom of God. Again, a bit of a parallel to the account in Luke with the shepherds. You know, through the angels, Jesus' birth was first announced to those amongst his own people who were outside the group considered respectable. They were social outcasts, as we spoke a little bit about last week. Here in Matthew... The birth of Jesus is first announced through the sign of a star to Gentiles, to those outside the Israelite nation. You know, it's a key contrasting theme in Matthew. Jesus was born to save his own people, but they did not make room for him. Matthew thus emphasises that Jesus came to bring salvation to all, even Gentiles. He came to bring salvation to any and all who would make room to see who he was. The one and only Son of God and then make an appropriate response of worship in their life. So as the Magi ask around, word gets to King Herod, who is disturbed, along with all of Jerusalem with him. I think we can read all of Jerusalem as those being the powerful and the elite and the religious leaders, those who wanted to keep the general people under oppression. Herod, of course, is greatly disturbed about any threat to his own power and position. Now it's reported that he murdered three of his own sons and his wife to protect his kingship. So he calls his experts and wise men, the Jewish religious leaders, who recount the prophecy of Micah in saying that the Christ, the Messiah, is to be born in Bethlehem. Herod then sends for the Magi and they come to him, for Herod knows the place, but not the timing. And I think he would have had the Jewish leaders recount the scripture to the Magi to try and impress them with, you know, my wise men know something you don't know. A bit of gloating. The Magi must have given Herod some indication of the timing. So we're not told what. But we read later, Herod had every boy aged under two murdered in Bethlehem, trying to eliminate Jesus. And Herod asks the Magi if they can return to him once they've found the child so that he too might go and worship him which we know are fake words, fake words of worship uttered from Herod's lips. So the Magi head towards Bethlehem. The star reappears and leads the way, causing them to be overjoyed. You know, worship is already building in their hearts. The anticipation of finding the one they were so keen to worship, the one who they had made room to come and find. The star stops over the house where Joseph and Mary are now staying. Another indication some time had elapsed, they were no longer in the cave or the stable or wherever they were in the night of Jesus' birth. And so the Magi enter in. They find the child Jesus with his mother Mary and they bow down and worship him. Now the word used for worship here means to kiss the ground when prostrating before a superior. Means being ready to fall down and prostrate oneself, to adore upon one's knees means doing all the physical actions needed to show obedience that's not obedience it's obedience which means deferential respect for someone of superior status you know these wise men instantly recognize that in the baby they see someone so much greater than themselves if jesus was only born a worldly king then the time to worship him had not yet come He hadn't yet ascended any throne. But from all they had seen and experienced, the Magi knew that this child was divine. This child was the Son of God and was worthy of all their worship from the moment they encountered him. It was the whole purpose and what they had made room for in this journey, to make room for submission, adoration and homage in worship. And as a continued act of worship, they present the gifts they had brought to this child, Jesus born king of the Jews, 
gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. Gifts that again emphasised they understood and knew this child to be a divine king. You know, the events of nature, or we could say creation, had initiated the Magi in their quest of worship. Scripture was needed to understand it more fully. You know, understanding that the child spoken of to be born in Bethlehem was indeed the Christ, the Messiah. But to fulfil their quest of worship, it ultimately depended upon the attitude of their heart. And I think that's confirmed in the final statement, that after leaving, they were warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, and thus they returned to their homeland by another route. When instructed to do so, something other than what they had planned, they continued to worship by paying respect to the authority of the one they had just seen. You know, as we sit on the cusp of Christmas Day 2020, the question God is whispering to you is that are you making room in your life for the proper response to the revelation of who Jesus Christ is? I pray your response is not a false one, like what we saw from Herod. You know, the right words upon your lips, but the attitude of your heart and what you are making room to worship is so far off. It's focused on worldly things and aspirations. For what God, through the actions of the Magi, has revealed is that the proper response is one of faith, believing and knowing that Jesus is the Son of God, and it is one of worship, giving all respect to the one who is so much greater than we are by giving deference to him for all authority over our life. Have you made all the room of your life available to worship Christ, Emmanuel, God with us? Is that the quest and the desire of your heart? Will you give up all? Will you submit your all of your life to make room and worship Jesus? The Holy Son of God, born to save us and to redeem us, to reconcile us to the Father for all of eternity. We each can make room for that in these moments just now. We're going to sing. It's the song that we sing as an item in our carol service, but I'll invite you all to sing tonight. Make room in your heart. Make room in your heart for Jesus. Let God write his story for you tonight. Come and worship him. Is there room in your heart for God? 
God to write his story. You can come as you are. It may set you apart when you make room in your heart and trade your dreams for his glory. Make room in your heart. Make room in your heart. Make room in your heart for God to write his story. Jesus was always born for that purpose, to claim us. So Lord, we pray all the worship of our heart may be given to you this Christmas as we celebrate the rest of this evening and into tomorrow. May we not neglect to give you room in our heart to praise and to be thankful and to know, to know just who you are. Lord, we praise you. How wonderful is the name of Jesus. What a great gift. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Amen. Cadence will bring the benediction to us. Thank you. Unto us a son was given, rejoice this Christmas day, a gift from God to you and I, the truth, the light, the way. To the world a saviour's born, rejoice this Christmas day, he fills the world with the soul's hunger's pain, the bread, the life, the way. To every heart bound in sin, rejoice this Christmas day, the gift of grace will set you free, the Christ, the Lord, the way. To thirsty souls everywhere, rejoice this Christmas day and drink from the fountain of life, the grace, the mercy, the way. To all of those who are heavy laden, rejoice this Christmas day, for he is the Prince of Peace, the door, the lamb, the way. Rejoice on this Christmas day, your Lord and Saviour is here. Rejoice, I say again, rejoice, let his birth bring your heart cheer. I invite you to stand as we sing our final carol, Joy to the World.
sharing some supper together and hunt down those chocolate bars. <laughs>